Okay, well, here we are. We're going to continue the series on the Communist Manifesto. This is going to be a general biblical response. And what I mean by that is this. I'm going to offer critiques, contrasts, and comparisons between the Communist Manifesto and the Bible. I'm doing this as a Christian. I have obvious biases here, and I'll put my cards on the table. I'm a Christian pastor. And uh, so I'm going to be offering... In this video, a very generic response. I'm going to be doing other videos on very specific topics, so this one's going to be sort of an opening statement, if you will. And uh, off the bat, I just want to say I'm going to try to be as generous as I can to Karl Marx as a person. And like I said in my previous video, I'm truncating Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels to just Karl Marx for convenience. I want to answer this question first. What gives you, you random pastor on the internet, the right or the idea that you should critique a great book and a great man? Well, I will say this. I don't know if I'm more intelligent than he is, and I don't actually think I care. It's not something I could measure, and it's not even something I want to measure, because intelligent people can say foolish things, unintelligent people can say wise things, and I, and I believe I'm going to be in that last category. I don't have to be a super wise person in order to reach beyond my own ability to think. And what I mean by that is this. As a Christian, I believe I benefit from the wisdom of God, and I reach beyond myself in that way. So that's why my critiques are not going to be based on any economic expertise that I have. I'm not an economics person. Um, I don't have a degree in economics or a lot of experience in that field. But I do, as a pastor, have a lot of experience studying the Bible. And again, I'm going to offer my perspective on what the Bible says and compare that to the Communist Manifesto. So it's going to be a parallel reading, if you will, comparative literature study. And it's not going to be off-the-cuff responses based on my um, nearly non-existent experience as a political science person or an econo economist. I also have one other distinct advantage over Karl Marx that has nothing to do with our wisdom or intelligence, and it's the fact that I was born over 130 years after the Communist Manifesto was written, and so my advantage point is literally my vantage point. Um, his predictions about the upcoming inevitable implosion of bourgeois capitalism uh, turned out not to be the case. And beyond that, the his triumphalistic prediction that the proletariat will win in the ultimate climactic final clash between the bourgeois uh, class and the proletariat class um, has not materialized. And on top of that, we see that the movements based on the philosophy of Karl Marx have been notoriously and traumatically bad. Now, that's not necessarily proof positive that no one could ever gain some material or spiritual or physical benefit from anything Karl Marx ever said. It just happens to be the case that the movements based on his philosophies um, have been murderous and destructive. Now, maybe you have, re you have a response to that, but again, I'm not going to come at this as a history or economics buff. Um, at this point, I'm going to try to respond using the Bible. So... I believe, assuming the best about him, that his, the, his writings on a, a futuristic, classless, utopian state um, have a rough correspondence to a, a universal evaluation of the dignity of human beings uh, made in the image of God. And so in one sense, I will credit him um, in the most generous way I can by saying that he shares, a, he shares an appreciation of the inherent value of people in the sense that he claims that the inequality that the bourgeoisie and other systems, feudal systems, um, that the reason why that was bad is because it harmed people. And so I'm inferring from that a kind of empathetic care for the poor that would be mirrored in the, the Communist Manifesto and the Bible. So I'll give him that. And um, that brings to mind Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where Paul writes, There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Also, we read in the book of James an encouragement not to, get, not to show favoritism to people who walk into the church who appear to be wealthy over and above those who walk into the church who appear to be poor. We see the Bible sort of in harmony with a, a positive view of Marxism in the sense that um, we're encouraged not to give preference over one person uh, preference to one person over another based on their class and wealth. However, when you when you don't just compare, but you begin to contrast the Bible and the Communist Manifesto, 
there are certain differences that arise immediately. So, for example, this may be obvious, but I'll say it anyway. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 is a theological claim of free and open access to the promises of God accomplished by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and it is not a call to arms or political action to forcibly delete um, the differences in classes, if that makes sense. The Bible's call to fight against oppression takes more of a form of taking care of the widow and the orphan, and not by political means or violent overthrow, the, the acquisition of bourgeois wealth. So there's a difference there. And like a lot of the differences, this, this is going to feel like we're comparing apples to oranges here, because Karl Marx was advocating for a literal state, and a lot of the principles we get from the Bible are spiritual. I mean, they're practical, but they're also spiritual. And we don't live in theocratic Israel, and so this, this comparison may feel strange. But at some points, you're going to see the obvious philosophical differences. Okay, so I'm going to take you to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to start in this verse 15. And we're going to read part of the Ten Commandments. Uh, we see here, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. So the Bible commands us not to covet other people's stuff and also tells us that we cannot take their stuff. In my opinion, this precludes the confiscation of bourgeois property and it also presumes an underlying right to possess private property. So not coveting somebody else's stuff sort of presumes the fact that they can, in fact, have stuff. And it also just assumes that, that people will. The Bible also affirms the right to give an inheritance, and I would contrast this with the ten despotic inroads. Um, the Bible even says that leaving an inheritance to your grandchildren is a really good thing. We see in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. So inheritance, you could give um, stuff, you can give wealth, you can give land to those um, that, you, that you leave behind when you die. It could be your children, your nephews, nieces, it could be your grandchildren. And we even see a story in Numbers chapter 27, verses 5 through 11, the daughters of Zelophedad um, petitioning for their right to inherit land uh, alongside their uncles. Um, even though they were women, and they were granted that right. And so this story is based upon the assumption that you can, in fact, inherit stuff. Moving on to inequality, I would say that in Proverbs chapter 6, we see that the Bible doesn't seem to just state that inequality happens sometimes from a morally neutral standpoint, but it almost seems as if the Bible is okay with certain kinds of inequality, almost as if it's a just judgment based on cause and effect principles. So we're going to see that now. Um, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander or overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Also, in contrast to the, the bourgeois merchant class that drove Karl Marx so crazy, Israel was actually told not to gain wealth by lending to their neighbors at interest. And so we see a certain kind of compassionate freedom to buy, sell, and lend within the, the context of the Bible. But the Bible also seems to um, grant the inherent drive to succeed, to survive, and to even compete in that setting. It makes no mention of a, a, a forced governmental safety net that would supply all the needs um, to, to all people done in behalf of the people by the state. But we do see a call to generosity from person to person without the middleman of the state. And I'm going to take you to Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. It says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Also in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19, When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you. 
and all the work of your hand. So instead of all of your harvesting being taken by the state and then distributed to everyone equally, what you actually see is people possessing land, that being tacitly affirmed by God, it's okay that they have it, they harvest it, but what God does tell them is don't harvest it completely so that the poor among you can gather the food that they need with dignity. That's charity. It's not indirect by means of the state. It's direct person-to-person -person charity. It was, your it was your own personal obligation to not harvest completely so that the poor, the fatherless, the widow, they can come into your fields and gather the food that they need. This was not a shared possession of the land. It was person-to-person -person generosity that was, that was not overseen by a government agency. Now, also I'd like to point out that there's a difference between generosity and taxation. If I'm being generous to the poor, I'm giving to them from what I have. That tacitly affirms the fact that I do, in fact, have those things. And it's a personal person connection that I think is more generous than taxation. Let's say, for example, I don't participate in taxation. What would happen to me? I'd be fined. If I didn't pay the fine, I'd be jailed. The taxation method of redistribution to the poor is, in fact, not necessarily generosity, but, and this is my opinion, participation in a system in which if I don't fulfill my obligations to the state, I'd be thrown in jail. You may think that that's tomato-tomato, but in my opinion, that's actually a significant difference. One seems generous. The other one seems ob um, obligatory at the point of a gun. And um, you can disagree with me on what, whether that is a significant difference. I'm just saying, in my opinion, that is a significant difference. Okay, I'm also going to take you to a few more verses before I finish. I want to show you 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. There seems to be no biblical warrant for a statewide safety net that provided everything that you needed. And so the obligation was on the family to take care of itself. Uh, you should be providing for your relatives. I'm parenthetically adding at the end, because the state isn't going to give everything to all people that they need. Now, you could say, well, that's only because the Bible is speaking to a culture, a specific context, and those people didn't have a safety net, socialist network, and they, they should have, and if, and if they did, God would have blessed it. Hypothetically, maybe, but... Um, the, the burden is still on you to provide for your family, and there's no mention of a state, um, a statewide safety net. And, and the fact that Jesus said you will always have the poor among you means, in my opinion, the Bible doesn't necessarily envision a strong hypothetical possibility that there will be a universal safety net, that you would give all necessary items to all people by means of a state. It seems to me, from my own study of the Bible, that, that there's no guarantee of that. In fact, there is sort of a guarantee that the principles of cause and effect will mean that if you don't labor and that you don't provide for your family, that there's a real threat of harm, a real threat of starvation and going without. Generosity is encouraged, and it's even um, given to Israel as a law, as part of the Torah, but there there doesn't seem to be a an imprisonment heavy fine if you don't completely comply. It seems to be within the realm of voluntary generosity that I would classify as charity, whereas the, the obligation and taxation, I would say, is outside of the, that semantic field or outside of that meaning. Okay. Okay, I want to I bring, bring you now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So, um, as opposed to the idea that um, from, from every person, according to what they're able to give, to everyone according to their needs, um, the Bible doesn't seem to affirm the idea that just because you need something, you should get it. There is a prerequisite of engaging yourself in meaningful labor in order to have the things that you need. See, when he says, the one who is unwilling to work, shall not eat. He's not saying the one who's unwilling to work shall not benefit for things that aren't necessary. He's saying eat, and as far as, I, as far as I can tell, eating is necessary for human existence. In other words, the Bible seems to be okay with you going without essentials if your choice is to not participate in a meaningful way with your labor. Some of you may feel that this is harsh, um, especially if you're a very empathetic person. 
However, it's hard to tell if there is a more powerful way to motivate the human mind and heart than necessity. Because whether you care to admit it or not, it seems to me that human beings are not perfect. I would call that sin. I would call that fallenness. Okay. Selfishness and laziness are real phenomena that you actually have to contend with and um, really do affect the quality of life that people uh, have. And I don't, I don't know if within the Marxist framework there's a real spiritual, metaphysical response to the fact that people really do sometimes seem to be extraordinarily self-centered and lazy. And so what would motivate the heart and mind of a man to work well beyond the amount that he wants to for his own convenience? In closing, it's my opinion that the Bible seems to correspond more with reality, the way I understand human beings than the Communist Manifesto does. And, and here's what I mean by that. Regardless of whether you want this to be the case, the fact is if you don't work hard and you, tr if you don't try to provide for your family, you're, you're going to come up against that need, that necessity and desperation, even in the face of real lack. And the Bible seems to go there. The Bible seems to say, look, if you don't provide for your family, you're acting terribly. Why? Because you are not guaranteed the basic essentials to life. You are not promised to always be fed. You're not promised to be taken care of by a, an all-powerful state, nor does the Bible say that God's going to feed you whether you work or you don't. God gives the rain to the righteous and the wicked. God created plants and animals for your food, but there's no promise. It's not going to be brought to you. The Bible's view on work and uh, cause and effect, the human heart and the, the internal motivations of a person seem to be more nuanced and mature than the triumphalism I see in the Communist Manifesto. I, I don't see any um, realistic conception within the Communist Manifesto that the human heart can be completely and overwhelmingly wicked and self-centered. Um, the, the reason why I believe the Bible says that there will always be poor among you is because there's an implicit assumption there that um, wickedness is going to take its toll, and wickedness takes many forms. Sometimes it's oppression, sometimes it's laziness, sometimes it's theft, sometimes it's coveting, etc., etc. And I, I don't really see something on the Communist Manifesto end really delving deep into the, the, the solutions to the deep wickedness in the heart of a man. And so, in my opinion, the, the Communist Manifesto's dream world utopia of uh, a classless agrarian society is at the end of the day exactly that, a dream world. Thank you for watching. Um, like if you liked, share if it was helpful, and I will see you in my other videos.